are here this morning. And I just, I want you to know all your hope shall always be in Jesus. And no matter what the situation in life is, if you can keep that in the very center focus of your life, that your hope is in Jesus. This morning, I, I want to share a, service, a sermon with you this morning, a message, if you will. And, and, it's a, it's, it's, and I have to be honest with you, so you, I want you to know my heart and, uh, and, and what, how I feel about this subject. Um, it's about money. I know what you're thinking right now. Gosh, I picked the wrong Sunday to come here. And, and I have to be honest with you, um, I've been here for quite some time. I've probably preached, maybe spoke two or several times on this subject. And I, let me just tell you, I'd rather watch paint dry than do this. <laughs> and, and I had to teach myself this week that sometimes there are messages that you preach that the Lord gives you. You may not be as excited about it as he is. And, but let me tell you what happened as the week went along. Last Sunday when you pulled out your worship folder, and there's always the pulse of the church, we keep you abreast where we are and what's going on. We've been a long two years, long two years. Our church hasn't made budget in two years until this past week. We, we were $40,000 in, in the deficit. And you say, well, well, what did y'all do to correct? We've been correcting for a year and a half, trying to do this, justice, stop this, quit doing this, making jobs, going to part-time jobs versus full-time jobs, and just trying to do every single thing we can. We don't waste money around here. We're, we're a church that try to utilize every dime we have to make sure we have lots of people helping us. If you'd have been here this week, we had people out front pressure washing didn't cost your church a dime. We had folks that are back here in the back are replacing all the boards on the deck. It's not costing you a dime. They're paying for it out of their pocket. We've had people come and clean carpets because we, we cut in those areas, gave up their time. And so that's, that's good. And we're, I'm trying to tell you is we ain't wasting no money here. And people, when we begin to look at it from that perspective, it's because things are different. 46% of the people that we had two years ago have only come back. 54% of the people have not come back. And it affects you in every area of your life. But I serve a God who can provide every single thing we need as Christians this morning. And he's providing for this church to go from a $40,000 deficit and do it a week that you got to have and come out with $3,000 in the surplus. That's a good thing. That just shows you how powerful God is. So when I started thinking about this, I, I, I want to share with you, this is not in your notes, and this is free. There are three areas of your life that you're going to have to make a decision on. Three. Just three. It's got nothing to do about getting married. It's got nothing to do about getting the top job that you want. It's three things. Number one is giving your life to Jesus Christ and, and letting him become Lord and ask him to come into your life and to save you. That's your biggest battle, battle you'll ever have in your life. The second thing is, is baptism. Now, there's many different organizations, different people, and different ways of doing baptism. And, and uh, in the Baptist church, we hold you down to your bubble. Other churches get you top of your head. I, I'm not here to de debate that. I'm just telling you, when a person follows in Christian baptism, they begin to let God become the center, and they begin to let God use them. And then the third place is money. When someone was teaching, I grew up in a home that my parents went to church every time the doors opened, and I remember so fine every Friday night in our home. They had envelopes. That's how they did stuff in those days. And that they gave 10% right off the top of the whatever it was, and they gave that and put it in an envelope, and then on Sunday morning they put it in an offering plate. If we made, us boys made a dollar, we had to give 10 cents to the Lord on Sunday morning. We had our own little envelopes and all those things. Well, I'll be honest with you, as I grew up and got older and got married and, and all that, I, I, I moved away from that. I, you know, I, I began to listen to some of the crazies that tell me, well, Jesus came and he, he, he took care of all those things. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But I started buying into that mess and realized that was wrong. Because we're taught, this is, just so that you understand, this is the whole book. This ain't just part of the book. 
And the Old Testament in here is so crucial for today as we are Christians today. It gives us a model. And it starts in Genesis and it comes all the way through. It gives us a model of how to give our gifts to the Lord. We call it tithes. We call it offerings. That's above your tithe. Many of you, we've challenged you last week in, in, a, in, a, in an email about doing the $20 challenge. That $20 challenge is that you're giving $20 above your tithe. Every week we seem to get this, so you kind of know, it's at the end of the month we're behind, and we're hoping that the $20 a week wouldn't hurt. We've got people that are running, putting on their uh, little, little thing, what do you call that thing out there? Huh? Yeah, that thing, the app. And you can go on there and, and say, I'm going to give $20 above that, and, and it'll do it every week for you. It'll take your money whether it's there or not. And, and, and what happens, no, I'm just kidding. So what happens, you can do that. For me personally, I'm, I'm feel from the old school, I want to write a check. I want to put an envelope. I want to lick that stinking, sticky stuff, put that baby in there. And so what happens, and during the week, last Sunday as we started, I had to run to the bank. And get a twenty dollar bill. I didn't have. I don't carry any cash. Uh, and so I went this this week. I was on. I was on top of that thing this week. I got my twenty dollars that early and put it in the envelope and put it in. And what happens is that when we're obedient to the Lord, and I will teach you this at the end. If I can get you this morning to listen to me just for a few moments about giving and how to do it and what the Lord does with it, just give me. Just don't lock out this morning. Don't block me out. I know you're punching your neighbors. I know I invited you, but this is not the Sunday to do this. But you, 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 well, then you come back and give me another chance, okay? I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good, so you'll enjoy it. I, I put this whole idea of this sermon together, and I called it No More Leftovers. When I was growing up, uh, we, we didn't throw food away. We didn't waste any food. When we went to the table, if you didn't like what Mama fixed, you're going to starve, so you learn to eat that stuff. And so what happens to us is that we begin to realize the leftovers were very small. I don't like leftovers today. That's why I clean my plate so I don't have to do that stuff. And, and what we learn to do is, is that we don't need to give God our leftovers. We need to give God the first. The Bible is clear. If you will study the scriptures, and just a moment I'm going to teach you how to do this, you'll discover that this thing called 10%, it didn't start back in the book of Malachi. It didn't. It started in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to show you that in just in a second. What I'm challenging you to do today is don't give God your leftovers. Give God your first. So let me tell you about this. Jesus is a radical when it comes to money. One-third of everything that Jesus talked about was about money. He, he, he began to show us, and, and I know what you're thinking. I, you know, when we start thinking about money, I need money. I, w- I want more of it. You know, that's kind of the philosophy we have. But whoever thinks that you can't buy happiness doesn't know where to shop. That's kind of our philosophy in America today. You say, well, I can buy happiness. Sure can. If you get me a new pair of boots from Buckle or new blue, I'm pretty happy for about a day or two. And what happens to us is that we can't buy happiness. We can't. Money is powerful. It governs some of the very basic daily interactions for buying food, or paying two prices at the gas pump, paying for education and all those things. And money is what makes the world go around to a certain point. You got to have money. I used to tell my dad, you know, I I want to, can I have $10? And he said, no. He was always, his answer was no, everything. And and I said, why? He said, well, you got to have the money. You got to have some money in your pocket. So, dad, you know, I'm not worried about money. And he would say, yeah, but you got to have it to stay here. And there's a lot of truth in that. Even though he was so tight, he squeaked when he walked. So, so what happened is that you and I need to understand, but also with money, there's great harm to happen. We see it in Ukraine when people start harming people because they have money to buy and to build and, and destroy people. So I went through the scriptures, and I, I wanted to look at a couple of things. And you'll have to write these addresses down that I'm getting ready to give you. But in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, there's a little short guy named Zacchaeus. And if you know that story, Zacchaeus has heard that Jesus is coming. He climbs up in the tree because he's a little short Napoleon kind of guy. 
And, and what happens to him, he sees him, and then Jesus invites him. You remember that story? Zacchaeus, come down. Well, I'm going to your house. And they go to his house, and because that Jesus is loving and kind and caring, and he witnesses to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus comes out. He is the chief tax collector, not, not the regular. He's the head honcho of the IRS. I know you love the IRS. And what happens, he comes out and he says, for you that I have cheated, I'm going to give all your money back to you. I'm, I'm going to give it back to you more than you gave. He's a changed man because he got his priority on money. The rich young ruler in Matthew 19. He's a young ruler. He has money. He has everything. He's good looking. He, he kind of reminds me of myself. And he, and he has all these things that are going for him. And all of a sudden he meets Jesus. And he says, now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good things should I do to inherit life? And Jesus goes through a little small list and talks about the, all the commandments. And he said, I've done all that. And Jesus gives him the kind of bottom of the thing. He says, well, I'll tell you what. Give all your money away and come follow me. And you know how the story closes? In verse 22 it says, But when the young man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see what happens to us, money can add value to the kingdom of God. Your church, this church will be going in July to go down to Connie Maxwell Orphanage. And it is there to help them so they can keep doing it. We got to meet the kids, some of the kids yesterday. I wasn't worth a flip coming back up the road because my heart was broken because those kids had to live like that. Your church will be involved in this because it is the only orphanage left in the state of South Carolina. And we have to do what the Bible says. The Bible tells us that we are to take care of the widows and the orphans. And this is what the scriptures tell us. And God gives it to us for a purpose. So what happens is wealth can be wonderful. I, I, I think a lot of folks just have that gift and they can make money. I'm, we love you here at Carolina Cornerstone. We, we love you when you can, and we love poor people. We love crazy preachers. We love, and because we know that everybody can't make money. I, I'm just not gifted in that area. I can spend it. I'm good at spending a part of it. So what happens to us, we begin to realize that is that we, Jesus wants to teach us in his scripture, old and new, coming together as one book, is that he begins to tell us that you and I worry about money. So let's just do a survey. How many of you have ever worried about money? Raise your hand. Okay, hold, hold on a second. We're taking pictures. Get your hands back up. i tell you how I can help you. If you've never worried about money, let me borrow your checkbook this afternoon. <laughs> I can help. But so what happened? He wants to take the worry. He wants to take the stress out of it. I know people that have stressed all their lives because they're just doing the best they can. And God says, I want to take all that away from them. I want to take all the worries. I, I want to take, I want to give you peace. And God can give you that. See, sometimes in life, we, we have people that are just people in our lives that we're trying to do. And we can look in scripture. You can look at Luke 16 of a screwed manager who is just mean and he's thief. And somehow God shows us mercy in this thing. And for you and I this morning, he wants us to see that we need to be people who are dire right with the Lord. We need to get our lives in order. We need to get sin out of our life. And we need to be obedient to what he's calling us to do. So what does the Bible say about all this? God instituted tithing. I didn't, let me tell you, I didn't start it because if I had started, I'd, the percentage would have been higher. I promise you that. I wish the government would take the 10% concept too, but they don't. So what happens to us is that we begin to understand that God institutes tithing as what? As a part of worship. God don't need your money. Carolina Cornerstone might, but God doesn't need your money. And what he teaches us is that it's a form of worship. We give our worship. If you were to read in the book of Genesis, the 14th chapter in verses 17 through 20, uh, you'll, you'll discover a story where Abraham blesses the king. And he, after the war, he gives him 10% of all the spoils. This is the first time we see anything about giving spoils. And we begin to realize that by giving the tenth, Abraham was saying, God, I'm giving you the credit for this success. It's a worship. It helps us. He begins to keep moving with us and show us. 
He says in Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran church, these are, these are three conversations a person needs to experience, Luther says. Just wait she has a real baby. That's what it is. I probably shouldn't have said that. I, I, I was there when she was born. I know. I, I was there with her mom and daddy. Yeah. And, and yeah, she's going to get a payback, isn't she, Stacy? <laughs> so the Lord, he's blessing us. So let me go back. I don't got off track here. This is a good thing I got notes. Uh, Martin Luther says there are three ex- conversions that a person needs to experience. And number one is the conversion of the head. Of what you believe about God. The other conversion is the conversion of the heart. And then he says there's the conversion of the pocketbook. You see, this is what God is teaching us this morning. That when we get right with the Lord and we get our hearts right, we don't worry about it. So let me, let me clarify. A lot of times people... They say, well, that was in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. My friend, that won't fly in the Scriptures. It won't fly. The, your, your Old Testament is a model for the New Testament. He gives us those percentages so that you and I can make sure we have all this. Jesus says a lot about money. He, he taught us about money in ways that we can remove the peace and we can have peace in our lives and not worry. And, and as your pastor, as your friend... Someone who loves you and who cares about you. I want you to be blessed by God in every area of your life, including your finances. But there's some things that you and I have to do. So let me tell you what Jesus says about money. One third of everything Jesus taught was about possessions and money. The the Bible mentions it between 800 and 2,000 times. Depends on how you look at it. it. It talks about the parables about this and about money. There's two truths about money. It will not last, but it can have an impact on eternity. The only subject that Jesus talks more than about money was about the kingdom of God. He, he, he knows, and you say, well, why did he talk so much about money? Because he knew you and I would have problems with it. Let's do another survey. How many of you would be, admit today that you've had financial struggles along the way, some part of your life? Would you raise your hand? Absolutely. And so he, he knew we would struggle with it. And he knew we would have tough times with that. See, Jesus sees and affirms in Matthew 23 when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the ain't no secret religious leaders, uh, he criticized them for neglecting their responsibility to act justly. He was telling us that when we give our money, we give it quietly and, and almost secretly, if you will. And so we don't stand on the corners of the street. Oh, Lord, don't let me be like those old cheapskates. Let, Lord, you know my heart. That's what he said. Don't be going around bragging about what you give. And don't stand on the street corners expecting a pat on the back. And Jesus teaches us that you and I need to pay attention to this story in Luke 21 when he is looking at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he realizes that there's a little lady comes in. She's a widow and she gives the might. She gives everything she has for Jesus. You see, in our church, we're teaching you about the pregnancy center that we're doing all this collection for out here. This week, I went and got me a couple of those green bottles, because I like green, and I went to my truck and filled both of them up with change. I didn't know I had so much change in there. I wonder why my truck's losing gas miles. <laughs> and, and so we put that change in there, and, and, I'm, 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 and I'm watching people do it. Your nickels and dimes and quarters and whatever make a difference to people that are struggling. This is what we give. This is why we give the money. We give it to worship the Lord. And, and Jesus teaches us something else. When, and this lady gives it all that she has, he blesses her. He, he tells us this morning, when we are people that are sold out to Jesus Christ, we've given our life to Christ, he tells us that Jesus is going to put people in our lives to help. And so when this happened, Jesus says, give one who asks, Matthew 5. He tells us, give those who ask, don't turn them away and say, wait till tomorrow. Do it now. Uh, don't, he says it's something else. He says, don't show me your giving. Don't be show off with it. Don't, don't be showing off what you got. Just give it and be nice. That's why I love this church, is that I like it wearing blue jeans. 
And, and I want you to be comfortable. And the summertime comes, if you want to wear short pants, I don't care. I don't care. I just want you to come and, and be comfortable. And people want to be alike in the church and, and be seen. I want you to enjoy worship. And then he says, uh, don't store up your treasures here. Uh, store up your treasures in heaven. He, he tells us this. He says in Matthew 6, 19, store, uh, stop storing up your treasures here on earth. And, and we begin to see this is that we can get greedy with it. And God's trying to teach us not to do that. He, he says worrying about money can strangle your spirituality. In Matthew 13, 3, he uses the parable to tell once there was a man who went out to sow grain. And what he was talking about is if you don't sow, you ain't going to reap anything. And if you're ever going to be used by God, you're going to have to be people who understand it'll cost you time, it'll cost you money, and it'll be inconvenient for you. If you're waiting on everything to line up, the stars and all that stuff, for you to be used by God, you'll never do anything for the Lord. He wants to interrupt your life. He wants you to stop. He wants you to help people. He wants us to be able to do things that are beyond anything we can imagine. We have a project at Connie Maxwell that's going to be big. And, and already, Jason's told me, I can't go there. I can be there with him. But me and, and the president of the, uh, Connie Maxwell, we have to go find a place because all we want to do is talk. And, and so what happened? It's a big job, and we're trying to figure out how to pay for it and how we're going to do this and how we're going to work with, and get people down there and give up. And people will come up and give up their whole week of their vacation to do this. And I'll tell you this. I was remembering yesterday as we came back, I remember of a story that happened when our church was involved in missions and we were in Savannah, Georgia. We're on our way to Savannah, Georgia. I think it was the first time we had ever been there, and we didn't know much about Savannah. Uh, all I know is my, one of my heroes, John Wesley, is, was very powerful there in his days. And, we're, and we left here, and I, I was at the very back and said, I'm going I'm to be the last one because I want to make sure everybody gets there safe. And we get down to about Columbia, uh, and, and a man that we were following had a flat tire. I wish you had been there to see it. We jumped out of our vehicles. It looked like Dale Earnhardt's pit crew. We jacked that thing up. We yeah, zipped on that thing. We, I mean, you know. And, and we got back and said, man, this is good. We, okay, we're only about 15 minutes behind. And we go five miles, and he has another blowout. And that's what happens when you buy them, them old cheap colonial tires. So, so what happens, we have to take him all the way down the side of the safe lane, and we get down to, there's a, there's a Walmart always. We get to Walmart, and, and we had some couples that kind of hung in here with us. Uh, one of them was new, so... We, the Lord let this happen so we could go into Walmart and there was a McDonald's in there. I'm not passing up none of them French fries. I got to have me some. And so we go in there and we become friends. We get the man's thing back on and we get down there. We get, it was, when we got almost to Savannah, we had this storm that just hit. I mean, it was terrible. I had planned something on, for Sunday night and, and obviously the Lord didn't want me to do it on Sunday night. So on Monday night, we had a foot washing. Now, you go, what? Yeah, we had a foot washing. It lasted three hours. This is what happens when you become obedient. When you say, yes, I'll give my week up, God will bless you. He always does. You'll see things that you would not normally see. See, what happens with wealth and money, it, wealth security can blind us from real needs. It can blind us from needs in the church and begin to listen. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of it. It's the love of it. See, so, so what is tithing? Let me, I'm going, and I just want you to stay with me. Don't close up yet. Tithing is 10%. The Hebrew word translates 10%. I, somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, I wonder why God chose 10%. I, I don't have a clue. He could have chose 40, 60, or he could be like your government and charge you 90, and whatever it is. What, but the, he picks 10. And then he gives us a very clear description. He says, bring your money to the storehouse. If you read this and understand it from the Hebrew language, and you'll begin to read, what is the storehouse? It's your local church. It's your local church. And, and what it takes, it, 
does this. And he says, bring your money. Bring your money. And what will happen is, practice makes perfect. I just want you to know. <laughs> so what happened? He says, bring your money. And he said, then he says, then I want you to test me. It's, it's one of the very few places in Scripture that Jesus tells him to test him. I, I will tell you this. God does not need your money. He needs your heart. If you get your heart right, you'll get your pocketbook right. The reason why tithing is so important, a theme in the Christian faith, it's a symbol how God calls us to live and live as stewards, not owners. Here's what it means. You may think you own your house and your car. God is just loaning it to you. Because you know how I know? Because we'll see what happens. If you were to pass away today, your kid's going to be driving your truck. It ain't yours. It's on loan. So I don't look at, I own anything. I look at it as a steward, a manager, if you will. I'm just trying to manage God's stuff. And see, I've learned that God tells us that tithing is a spiritual discipline. It's the little secret of life I want to give you. Whatever you want God to bless, put it first. You want God to bless your marriage? Put it first. You want God to bless your finances? Put it first. You want God to bless your company and your business? Put it first. He tells us that. He says that if your marriage is what you want to have, put it first. And what we begin to realize is that God blesses those things. You, you can't outgive God. I've tried. It don't, you can't outgive God. God will bless you and he'll bless your pants off. I swear he will. If you do and be faithful to him, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says this. Honor the Lord by giving your, him your money, first parts of your crop. Not the leftovers, but the first parts. See, this whole thing, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And God says, give it to me right off the top. Now, I have people who come to me all the time because I'm trying to teach and work with people. And they say, well, pastor, uh, do you give the 10% off the net or the gross? Okay, here's my answer. You ready for this? This is some deep stuff here. Do you want to get blessed on net or you want to get blessed on gross? Let me, let me stop for a second. Some of you in this room are saying, I can't tithe. I understand that. I've been there. But I want to teach you something this morning. Start somewhere. So uh, I have 2% I think I can do. Start at 2%. Set your goal. Plan that thing. And what you'll begin to discover, the 2% will be blessed. And then you'll be able to step. And before you know it, you're at 10. And then the Lord might even lead you to do something else longer than that. You see, this is what happens. You can't out give. God has brought and helped me. I don't know how many times. I don't know how many times God has blessed me when I didn't know how things were going to work out. I have talked to a person who's a financial advisor, a good friend of mine, a good Christian man. And I, he said, Pastor, I want you to tell your people this week, the best time to start tithing is when they're in debt. I said, well, that's going to be funny. He said, well, it's because everybody I know is broke. Yeah, they got to be in debt. And he says, because what happens, God will show them if they will trust him, he will get them out of debt. He will give you advice how to do it. If you want to get out of debt, start tithing. Start focusing on what you're spending your money on and what you're doing. And put God first. I, my grandfather used to say, um, someone would say to him, you can't, I, I can't afford tithing. He would say, you can't afford not to tithe. And, and what happens, God blesses you. I want to encourage you this morning, give what you can. Give what you can. Remember this about money. This is what I've learned a long time ago. Money is a tool to be used. First Timothy, it writes in 1 Timothy 6, 18, tell them to use their money to do good. Do good. Help people. And, and you'll be surprised what God will do in your life. He says money is a test of character. In Luke 16, if you're, un, if you're a trust worthy about the world well god will trust you with the riches of heaven he tells us that throughout the gospel jesus uses money 
as a tool to help us to find out what true priorities are. They're true priorities. What is the most important thing you can do with your money? And what God has done through your life, he's put money in your hands. And he's trying to teach you how to manage it well. The Bible says, if we're faithful with little, God will give us more. And God wants us to be faithful people with that. So why should I tithe? I mean, why should I tithe? It's a way to show that we trust God in our lives as well as our finances. Tithing helps the local church to help do the activities. Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, we're having vacation Bible school here in July. It's going to be hot, and it'll be sweaty, and, it, and, and the youth will be stinky by the time they get through working with the, youth, the children. And, and, it, and what will happen is uh, it's on Thursday. I get the pleasure to always talk to the kids about accepting Jesus as their Savior. And we'll spend a lot of money. We'll have to. And, and we're doing everything we can. And what happens after I give that little conversation with those children, they'll, they'll come back and Brandy will come find me and, and, and they have to have their card and they'll go tell their teacher. And, and then when that one kid gives their life to Christ, it melts us. Every dime that we would spend is worth a child coming to Jesus. This is why today I want to challenge you as you leave today, out on these tables out here, or vacation Bible school sign-ups. We need people to help us. We got, we got a, a, a hole in the preschool area. We need your help. You say, I've never worked with children. Well, it's about time you did. And, 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 and what happens, you, you'll become so enthralled with helping them, but you can't help it. You, you, you just want to love on them and be with them. If you that are with me this morning, at the church ends here in about 2 o'clock when I get through with this sermon. And what will happen is you'll come out and you'll sit. When I'll be talking to an adult and the child walks up. I, just, I stop you for a second and I just hug on the young ones. Because they are precious in his sight. So we're going to trust God with Vacation Bible School. We're going to trust God with everything that happens here. He, he tells us that we give it out of generosity. The Bible tells us that tithing is a way to show that we trust God. It, 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 tithing is not for God's benefit. Tithing is meant for our benefit because of the sacrificial portions of income uh, remind us to rely on God to meet our needs. It makes us more aware of the needs of other people. When I started tithing what the Lord gives to do it, I started paying attention around me of people that need help. And, and, and giving of your tithe encourages a grateful and generous spirit that steers us away from being greedy. Do you realize there are people that are greedy? I see it all the time. I see it all the time when people, they're worried about their pennies and nickels and dimes. And we need to be past that. So I want to teach you this morning how to have an attitude on about tithing. Now, it's real simple. It's three little things. Uh, it's real simple. Number one, it's a gratitude for the past. Wait, what now? The gratitude of the past of what God has done. Of what God has done. He's blessed us. God, I wouldn't have anything if it weren't for you. That should be our attitude of the past. And then he says, the second thing, it prioritizes in the present, the moment, right now. Is God, I want you to be first in my life. I want you to be first in everything I do. I want to start my day with you. I want to end my day with you. I want to talk to you all through the day about this. And then third is a statement of faith in the future. He says it's a statement of faith. God, I believe that you're going to keep your promises. All 7,000 promises that are in your word. And so how do I tithe? Well, one of the things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to change the way you think. That you're a steward, not an owner. You've got to remember you don't own anything. You're just, it's just being loaned to you and passing it along. Giving should be an act of worship. In Romans 12, 1, it says, Let them be living, holy sacrifices, the kind that will find acceptable. This is the true way to worship. Giving should be in proportion. If you, whatever you make, the more you make, the more you give. 
It's as simple as that. And it, it would be amazing if everybody gave that way, the church wouldn't have financial needs. Do I like talking to you about money? No. But this, the Holy Spirit six weeks ago gave me this sermon, and I'm preaching because I love you, and I want to see you blessed. I don't want to see you lose that. I want you to get everything that God has for you. And he tells us this, that giving, tithing should be voluntary. I don't want to grudge you. I don't want you to grudgingly give your money. God doesn't want to. He wants a cheerful heart, not someone who just doesn't want to do it because he got to. If you do it that way, God's not going to bless you either. So giving should be planned. Some of you get paid um, twice a week or once a month, whatever, twice a year, whatever it is. And, and you, you figure, well, some of you don't get paid at all. But what happens is you, the Lord gives you the money twice in a month. When I was growing up, they gave you a paycheck every week. And, and, and you learn to plan those things. And you find out to give the Lord what he asked for. And, and I believe one of the things I've learned is, uh, you're going to laugh at me, but I've seen people uh, give exactly 10% of what they got. I'm one who says round up a little bit. I don't like change much, you know. So what happens, he teaches, he says, give cheerfully and then be given generously. So there's been a standard that has been set for us in the Old Testament. There's a standard that is set when Jesus speaks to us that we're to give. All tithes and offerings should be given with pure motives and the attitude of worship. So let me hit you where it hurts. I'll tell you the biggest struggle I have with this whole thing is I don't understand something. Is that some people can trust God to his promise to save them and take them to heaven. But then they don't, they don't trust his promises to take care of them financially. This is about a trust issue this morning. It's about you trusting God with what he has given you. I could sit and debate all day long about this and about that. But this is about the heart of trust. See, I, I, the other day I was, we were talking. I've been working on this for quite some time. It does, and, and, and Anita gave me this. And it was something that she, and I quoted, the tithes are stolen. Satan has stole the belief in tithing for many Christians. Many try to reason their financial budgets and couldn't support tithing. And that tithing is just some old, old Testament teaching anyway. Yet Satan lures us into not tithing. God views us as robbers and disobedient in that situation. Let me tell you a story. There's a man who would be the most wealthiest man of his day. You've probably heard of him. His name is John D. Rockefeller. Way back, he would be the Bill Gates of his day, of all the money. He was no doubt the far, far wealthiest man in the world. He was very famous for having asked multiple times. He'd been asked, what is the secret of your wealth? And Rockefeller would always reply the same way, 10, 10, 80. And he said, this is how I got wealthy. Of everything I made, the first 10% went to God. First 10%. The second 10% went into savings. And I learned how to live on the 80%. 10% goes to God. 10% goes to investments. And 80% is what he learned to live on. And that's how he became wealthy. If it'll work for him, it'll work for you. It'll work for me. Jesus does not, and God does not put this burden on us about money. So this is the results. If you will become obedient to the Lord this morning. If you will give your life to Jesus Christ. If you will, will follow him and be in baptism as you should. And then your money. Your tithe. See, your obedience means that you can walk with God. If you're not obedient, you're not walking where you ought to walk with the Lord. When you're obedient, you can obey God's voice and you can hear when God speaks to you. When you're obedient, God will bless you. 
When you're obedient, you're choosing God's best, not good, the best. When you're obedient, you're trusting God to be God, and you're not. When we obey, we don't try to control our lives and the situations around us by our own human strength. Instead, focus, focus, focus on the Lord by keeping Him and His Word before your eyes, allowing Him to have His way and trusting and fulfilling His promises to you. Tithing means we start today. We need to start today. And we need to be people who are sensitive to the people around us and we need to help people. I want to ask you this morning, what's first place in your heart? You say, well, maybe, maybe it was my grandkids. I understand that. I have a granddaughter. Somebody said, how, how many grandchildren do you have? One. You don't want more? No, we can't afford no more. <laughs> and so what happens to us, God is speaking to us this morning to change the way we think. It ain't your money. Matter of fact, I was talking to somebody this week, and they said, well, if you don't tithe, God still gets his money. No, I ain't figured. He said, everything in my house breaks when I don't tithe. He said, I'm just trying to, I'm just getting ahead of that thing. You see, for us this morning, it's a matter of the heart. Give back to what is God's. Keep yours for yourself. But give God first. So this morning, I, I, I want us to stop and I want us to pray. I want us to pray that God will give us a clear heart and a clear mind about giving. And that he will show us how to do it. Even if I have to start at 1%, he will show me how to do this. And I can begin to be a faithful person to him. Jesus loves you. He's making your path as easy as he humanly possibly can. Because he wants you to be successful in what you're doing. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray for you for a second. And then we're going to, we're going to give an invitation in just in a second. God, I want to thank you for this morning. That you would help us. That God, you would guide us in these moments. That you would help us. Lord, tithing, once we learn how to do it, it changes how we see you, Lord. God, I trust you. I want to thank you for getting our church to where we are this week. I, I, Lord, I have to be honest as I got here and knelt on this altar. Lord, I didn't know how you were going to do it. I just know you can. You can do more than I can even imagine. And Lord, would you help us to change our hearts? First, Lord, would you give us salvation that we would make that decision? And then second, Lord, we would be willing to follow in baptism. Getting rid of the old self and putting on the new. And then, Lord, help us financially. This morning, I, I just, I want the Lord just to move us in a mighty way. So, Lord, right now, there may be people in this congregation who want to join this church, who want to be a part of the fellowship. Lord, I want them to come right now and stand with me. And Lord, today,